right. All right. All right. Fine. I'll be a gracious host. How you Little Mermaid is the scariest Disney movie fight. by far, though. Why the hell is Ace Blade in your Kickstarter? <laughs> comics and we're gonna i'm getting controversial today we're gonna get controversial today with with my my proudest moment is this interview and being able to talk to you too ladies and gentlemen boys and girls children of all ages taurus comics in collaboration with fourth wall productions respectfully brings to you the 128th episode of the Four Tales podcast. I am your host, Kyron Silva from Taurus Comics. Across the way is the plum reporter of Ace Blade, Danny J. Quick, and together we are your two award winning blurred comic creators here to help you find your next favorite comic. We are live on the Age of Geekdom Network via Facebook, Twitter. No, nope, no, nope, we're not on Twitter anymore. Facebook, Instagram, Twitch, YouTube, and TikTok. So if you're listening or watching us live, thank you for your support. But don't forget to like, subscribe, share, and view this podcast because all your positive reviews, interactions, help us reach a bigger audience. You got to rewrite it. You I gotta know. It. Yeah, you got to take, take Twitter out. They since they started charging us for stuff, and we can't. <laughs> now we don't have access to it anymore. You can't can't say it. You got to be honest. I know, and I feel like Facebook's slowly going to that same thing. Like they're they've been doing some updates recently that makes me feel like they're gonna be like, hey, you want to stream live with us? You got to pay us, yeah, five dollars a month, and I'm not right. gonna do that. That's all right. As long as we're on the Agents of Geek Network, we'll let them worry about that. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's right. All right. What's up, Danny? How you doing this week? I'm doing pretty good, man. I, ho- I hope you've been doing all right. You staying cool? No. Oh, okay. It has been a hundred degree upper 90s all week up until wednesday okay it's literally been that for like the last two months straight like almost every day upper 90s 100 degrees yesterday it was um upper 80s mid 80s today it's mid 70s Mm. well that's good mid 70s is good i i know it is it's great yeah i hate this weather (laughs) it's (laughs) We had we got a cold front coming through here. Like we had a bunch of storms out here the last week or so, the last two weeks. But uh, I went to work this morning and I was like, "Ooh, it's kind of chilly out here." Like I literally walked out the door, like, "Ooh, what's going on?" So uh, you know, it's starting to starting to cool down here too. Mm, okay. Well, um, I do before we bring our guests on, I do want to. Ooh, let me see if I got. Ooh, I hope I uploaded. I hope I uploaded this. Oh, I did not. Come on now, Kyron. You know. Oh, wait, no, wait, wait. I got it. So I, I want to talk about this video that I saw floating around the interwebs today. Um, this, this can't be good. What? <laughs> this can't be good. Kyron's I'm, right. never good. I'm excited for it, and uh, I'm going to show our, our our viewing audience the the video, and I I can't wait to see this. So let's let's go ahead and watch this. Sketch cover from my guy Kyron Silva over at Taurus Comics, he wanted me to draw his character, Saw the Lightning Builder, on a horse as payback for me making him draw horses all these times. I hope you like it, bro. I knew it. I knew it. <laughs> See? See? I told you it would be this week. I, that came out amazing. Oh, Are, are we going to see it? I got the pack. It's already packaged up. Oh. Packaged up. I got to drop it off at the, uh, the post office in the morning. Okay. I'm excited. I mean, I get the first ever. Well, you've done a sketch cover before, but yeah, I've done I've done sketch covers before. But I get the I've first. Never drawn, I've never drawn saw on an Ace Blade sketch cover before, or a horse. This is the first time I've drawn a horse <laughs> sketch cover too. That shit is hard, isn't it? <laughs> it's difficult, man. I don't like it. I don't like it at all. Yeah, that's what I feel like when I'm drawing Ballad of the Black Rose for you. And I'm like, I hate drawing horses. Why did it have to be a western? Why is this a western? Why can't it be a superhero? It was a good idea, but it was also a a bad idea at the same time. Mm. And speaking of bad ideas, uh, we have an amazing guest, an amazing guest on this week. Um, If if you've read comic books, you've probably read his work because um, from Top Shelf to Disney to Valiant to uh, DC, 
he's written it all. He's written it all. Um, and we're going to talk about some Superman stuff, but also the stuff with uh, Bad Idea that's coming out right now. Uh, Robert Venditti is in this show. How are you, sir? I appreciate you all having me on for episode 128. Uh, 127 other people before you all got to me, but I guess that's all right. I, at least I'm not 129. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Well, see, we we've had we had Dinesh on a few months ago, and we asked him at that point, "Can we have Robert on?" He's like, "No, don't have Robert on. He's a <laughs> make horrible. Him wait. Make <laughs> him wait until you're in the triple digits." Right. Yeah. <laughs> Terrible. We well, no, thank you for being on, Robert. No, I appreciate you guys. Thanks for having me on. Um, now, Danny did a great job going over some of your your accolades and the books that you worked on. But for anybody that maybe doesn't know who you are, do you mind giving us a sh very small? you know, introduction for yourself. Yeah, sure. Um, I'm a comic writer, been writing comics, I don't know, probably close to 20 years now, not quite, but I uh, started out doing my own independent things. I uh, did a book called The Surrogates for, at the time, a small press company called Top Shelf. They're now an imprint of IDW. Uh, that was my first uh, miniseries and graphic novel, got adapted into a film. And so that kind of helped get my uh, career started in a lot of ways. Um, I've done oh a lot of God. adaptation work. You know, I adapt all the Percy Jackson novels and make comics out of those. Are you just uh, realizing that his movie, that his <laughs> book was from the movie? Is that That's what's happening? Bruce, that was the Bruce Willis. I just oh realized that. Yeah. Literally at this moment. And I there actually... See, I would have been on in maybe number 93 if you knew. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. If only I would have known. I'm oh, sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt. Go ahead. <laughs> um, but... Uh, yeah, so I, I make uh, comics out of all the Percy Jackson books. Uh, those are very popular. And then i uh, done a lot of work for DC. You know, wrote Green Lantern for 80-something issues, uh, The Flash, Justice League. I do Superman 78. And uh, I've also started doing a lot of projects for Bad Idea, which is sort of a new, uh, newish publisher. They're about four years old now, but uh, kind of have a different outside-the-box approach to doing things, and I've been having a lot of fun with them. And uh, I've got... I don't know, probably a half dozen projects I've already written for them that are uh, waiting to come out. So, you know, we've got some good things coming up ahead. Nice. That's nice. Awesome. awesome. All right. So let's talk about this. Um, I mean, let's just start off with with Bad Idea. That's the last thing you mentioned. Um, you're coming out with a book called Planet Death. Mm -hmm. What is that about? So Planet Death is a project that, uh, like I say, I, I've been working on Bad Idea for a while. Before that, I worked with Dinesh. And a lot of the people at Bad Idea when I was at Valiant. And so I have really good relationships with them. And um, Dinesh uh, also has a good relationship with Derek Kolstad. He is the screenwriter and creator of the John Wick franchise. And so um, they, you know, Derek had an idea for a story, uh, thought it might make a good comic. And so um, Dinesh kind of put us together. And I worked from uh, a document that Derek had prepared and, and built the story. And essentially it's about a character named Scott who uh, wakes up on a ship. He's been woken, awake, awakened to do a mission uh, on an alien world. And uh, it's sort of a D-Day type story where we live through the invasion of the humans invading this alien world to complete this mission. And they have to destroy this weapon. And if they don't destroy the weapon, they don't get to go home. And so um, it's a very fast paced story. Uh, Tom Ostiarello is the artist and he's penciling and he's inking himself, which he hasn't done in a very long time. Uh, the art is phenomenal, and uh, we're about done with the first issue and still plugging away at it. And so I've uh, been having a great time working with Derek and Tomas on this. And how many issues are we going to get out of this book? It'll be four altogether, but they're oversized. They're 40 pages each. So, oh, nice. Yeah. I love Don't get that. ideas, Danny. I'm not doing a 40-page comic for you. <laughs> hey, listen, if I can afford it, we're going to make it happen. <laughs> we're going to make it happen. No, one of my favorite, my personal favorite issue of Ace Blade is, is our longer one. You get to tell, you get to put more into, you know, into the story. You get to slow down the pacing a little bit. And um, I think that that can be good sometimes. That can definitely be good sometimes. Yeah, no, I love the extra space. And that's one of the great things we're working with Bad Idea, you know, like a lot of times due to the constraints of monthly comics and publishing schedules and uh, sometimes economic factors and things like that, you know, costs and things. Uh, when you work for, you know, let's say DC, a 20 page book is going to be a 20 page book and you got to make the story fit in 20 pages, you know, bad idea is very much, I'll turn in the script and it'll be 24 and they'll say, no, make it 32. And then they'll be like, no, make it 40. You know, they always mm. give more space to it, uh, to really let the project breathe. 
and that's a great place to be in, you know, because these are these aren't familiar brands like Superman or or the Flash or anything like that. You know, this is uh, new content, new characters, new mythology that we're building from the ground up, and so it's nice to have the extra space to really lay that ground that groundwork and and give Tomas the space that he needs as well. I love it. I love it. Is there any any difference? I know some of these more recent books are coming out in different formats. You know, you got the standard, you know, six six two by ten comic book format. Is there any difference in a pers- in your perspective as a writer when you're when you know that the artist has a little more space um, to you're write about dimensions of the page? Dimensions of the page, yeah. but also, you know, in in terms of length of the story. Um, yeah, let's take them one at a time. Dimensions, uh, definitely. So there's another graphic novel that I worked on with Mr. Ballin. He's a uh, YouTube true crime, uh, strange, dark, mysterious stories, uh, and also on Spotify and things. He's one of the biggest uh, podcasters and YouTube personalities in the world. And I'm working on a book with him where I take a lot of his stories and adapt them to graphic novels. And the artist on that is Andrea Moody, who is a artist I've drawn before. He does pencils, inks, watercolors, the whole thing. It looks beautiful. It'll be out October 1st, and that book is smaller. The dimensions of that book are, are not as tall and a bit wider than a traditional American comic book. And so you definitely take that into account uh, when you're thinking about you know, a wider page and a shorter page and how many panels you're going to use and what kind of establishing shots and things like that. You know, Bad Ideas books are standard comic book size for the most part, um, but the page count is longer. And so definitely when you have more pages... Um, especially for a story like this, you know, like I say, you, you, you come right out the gate with a D-Day style invasion where these, you know, the human army is descending on a planet and they're getting shot out of the sky and, you know, they're advancing on the battlefield and, you know, cl- clashing armies and ships falling in the ground and exploding and like all this stuff, right? So when you have the extra space, you can really kind of pull back the camera and give it that epic sort of feel that is harder to do, uh, when you only have maybe 20 pages because in 20 pages you, you want the first issue to go somewhere and you want it to have like sort of a, a mini story in and of itself that ends but also leads into the next issue which will be its own mini story right and so if you only have 20 pages you got to give the readers a full reading experience and it's harder to do those big big shots or you know i might have pulled out some of those action set pieces and things and you know, Derek might have wanted to move some things around and, and do things differently if we only had 20 pages. So having 40 uh, is great for a story like this. Um, I do want to let everybody know. Uh, I We know that your comments are not popping up if you're on Facebook. We don't know what's going on. Uh, I've been trying to fix it right now, but nothing is working. So if you guys want to hop over to the YouTube, comments look like they work there, so I apologize. But... For some reason, if you're on Facebook right now, it is not allowing your comments to show up. So we apologize for that inter- uh, that issue. Uh, if they want, they can uh, they can tweet me, and I'll read their yeah. question and answer it. It's, uh, I'm just at Robert Vendetti. It's just my name. So if there's anybody that wants to tweet me a question, I'll be happy to answer it for you. Well, Javon, our, a good friend of the of the show, Javon Stokes, said that he loved your Hawkman run. Uh, he wanted to make sure that that uh, that you knew uh, that he admires your work. Um, and and Javon, just like Kyron. They are both. They both have like an encyclopedic knowledge of comic books. I'm I'm more recent into to comic books. You know, I started reading comics as an adult. But those two, they know. It seems like they know every writer, every artist, every story. So those are my two go tos, uh, Kyra. Yeah, nice. we, we fake it a lot. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, first of all, I appreciate it. You know, I'm super proud of the Hawkman run. Um, one of my favorite things I've ever worked on. Uh, but I'm like you, Danny. I didn't start reading comics until I was an adult either. I didn't read them at all growing up. So I read uh, that actually in the interview you did, and it yeah. was it was Astro City that made you yep. really get yeah, into. That comics. was the first comic that I read, uh, and maybe decide that I wanted to uh, try to write them. You know, I always wanted to be a writer. I took creative writing in high school, in college. I got my master's degree in creative writing and things, uh, but I was doing prose writing, fiction. You know, more like literary style fiction they call it. Um, but, uh, yeah, I read Astro City, and, and, and I really enjoyed it. Um, I loved how character-focused it was, which were sort of the principles that I was learning in a lot of the writing that I was doing. But that also, I liked the idea that I could tell a story and somebody would render it into art, you know? Um, so, yeah, I started reading comics in my late 20s, mid to late 20s. 
and then uh, decided I was going to try to write them. And uh, Astro City was what got me started. Yeah. Do you ever get that idea of, as you're writing a book, you might think, man, this might be the story that gets somebody else into comics, like it, like Astro City did for me? Yeah, I don't know. That's a good question. Nobody's ever asked me that before. I have had people uh, tell me that something I wrote is the first comic book they ever read. You know, that actually happened a lot with Superman 78. Uh, there were so many people that were fans of the film that, you know, had never sort of gotten that version of Superman in decades. And so um, when the book came out, I had a lot of support from inside, you know, the fans of the Reeve Donner films. And there were a lot of people I met that that was the first time they ever went into a comic book store, the first time they ever read a comic book and things like that. And so that's really nice. But I do always try to write everything because I try to write everything from the perspective of every issue is somebody's first issue because I was that person that was first issue. And after Astro City, I remember going into the comic book store and it was Superman number 800 billion and Spider-Man number 70 million. And it was like, where do I even start? You know, and so um, the mythologies and things seem very dense and alienating. So whatever I work on, even if it's a character like Green Lantern or, or Hawkman or something that's been around since the golden age, um, I try to make every issue so that if you have never read this comic book before, uh, you understand everything that's going on. If you have been reading the series, there are things there happening deeper that you realize are carrying forward a story in a way that maybe a new reader wouldn't. So I try to always try to walk that balance. Doesn't mean I always do it successfully, but it's always my goal. We talk about that a lot on on this show. We we interview a lot of indie creators, and um, you know, just the entry point into you know mainstream comics comics can be kind of you know, tumultuous for, for, for folks who haven't read comic books before. So um, I think it's great that we have companies like Bad Idea who are making new stories, you know, in addition to all the, the indie superheroes, superhero companies out here, you know, um, Bad Idea seems to be doing, you know, some, some stuff that's not just traditional superhero stuff. And I think that that's pretty cool. Yeah, for sure. They're doing a lot of different stuff. Um, I mean, just the things that I've done for them. Um, Planet Death is sort of a sci-fi war story. I have another book called Ordain, Ordained that they've um, announced. It's a very grounded crime story about a priest who uh, uh, gets called to the hospital because a patient has asked for last rites, goes into the room to give last rites to the patient, finds out the patient during the confession is an Irish gangster who confesses everything he's ever done and murders and everything uh, because he's going to die. Yeah. Turns out he has a miraculous recovery, doesn't die. So now he wants to kill the priest because the priest knows where all the bodies are buried. But turns out the priest wasn't always a priest. He came to the Catholic Church after he was a Navy SEAL and something happened in combat. So he's a former SEAL who's now a priest. And so got those skills. Completely different than Planet Death, right? And yeah. it's much I mean, more grounded like crime story. And so I have another story I've done for them that they haven't really announced yet that's more of an espionage story. I have a series of stories I've done with them that are sort of noir unreliable narrator about this guy who is a detective for a, a fast food pizza franchise chain and he like investigates uh crimes that are happening at the restaurant you know people stealing out of the till or whatever and he, in his mind he's like you know mickey spillane or whatever he's in his mind he's just this fantastic private detective you know but he's you know, investigating all these small things. And so um, they really do do a lot of different stories there. And, and that's great because uh, for me creatively, I don't want to do the same story over and over and over. You know, I, every project I do, I try to do something that's different from what I've done before. And even if you look at the superhero stories I've done, Green Lantern is very different from Flash, is very different from Hawkman, right? Like it's as far as the way I approach those characters. And so I'm always trying to challenge myself and do new things. And if they don't come out as good, um, you know, maybe I fumble or whatever. Uh, that's OK, because I'm learning from it and I'm hoping that I'm getting better as a writer and sort of expanding what I'm able to do. You know, One of the other uh, series that you're doing for Bad Idea is uh, Tankers. And that recently just that yeah. just got funded on Kickstarter. And I was reading the synopsis on that. And that feels like a crazy ass story yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, it's about time travel with a military group and you're trying to make more oil but then there's aliens that come yeah, through i was yeah. like 
So it's, it's like a satirical story with elements of sci-fi and things. And um, the tankers are a team of mercenaries in giant mech suits who work for a company called Greenleaf Oil. And Greenleaf Oil has invented time travel so that they can go back and divert the comet to kill the dinosaurs <laughs> so that there'll be more dinosaurs that will die and make more oil so that we won't run out of oil in the present, right? And so the tankers, cool. Yeah, so the tankers go back in time and they do that. And when they come back, the future is different. And now they have to figure out a way to set it right. And so we just did a Kickstarter that collects um, the entire first series, which is about 96 pages, and then has over 100 pages of new story on top of that. And, um, you know, we did that Kickstarter and it funded really well. So uh, I, I would hope that would be out pretty soon because uh, everything's already written and most of it's already drawn. So. so what kind of drugs were you on when uh, you were writing that? I just want to know. <laughs> None. <laughs> <laughs> totally straight edge, yeah. Uh, no, no drugs. Um, again, like I, I'd never written a story like that before, and so I don't think anybody has written a story like that. Yeah, before. but that's what's that's what's fun, right? Like, that's what's fun. Like, to me, I think if I did the same thing over and over and over, and this this is just my opinion, right? There's there's definitely people out there that will tell you and have very sexual careers, just staying in the thing that they do and becoming experts at it you know and when i did the surrogates and it had the success that it did i certainly had people advising me to just be the sci-fi guy man just keep doing sci-fi and i very consciously chose not to do that the next project i did was a political thriller you know and the thing i did after that was to adapt the percy jackson graphic novels and so i always wanted to do things differently and so whenever there's a chance for me to do something like tankers that I mean, what would I even, who would I even pitch that to? You know what I'm saying? Uh, but bad ideas, great like that. And yeah. and they don't just think outside the box in terms of the books that they do, which is very, you know, creatively freeing, but also in the marketing approach, you know, like I came up with this idea with this really good friend of mine named Brockton McKinney, who's a filmmaker. And uh, there's a place not far from where I live where you can actually go there and drive a tank and you can, you can operate a, a backhoe, like a giant backhoe, or you can drive a dump truck. You can, you can run over cars with a tank, and you can shoot a shoot a forty cal machine gun, <laughs> do all this crazy stuff. And so, you, we came up interested? with this idea that, like, what if I went to this place, and I said that I was a method writer. And so, before I wrote tankers, I had to thoroughly research things. And so, I went and shot guns and dug for oil and drove tanks and did all this stuff. And so, we pitched this idea, a bad idea, and they were like, "For yeah, man, what's the budget?" You know, and it was like, cool. And so we did this video that you can go find online where I'm shooting inflatable dinosaurs with a 40 cal machine gun. <laughs> it's crazy, you know, but uh, that's what's great about them as a company. You know, they're a speedboat and they just it's a lot of fun. And um, they have this very open sort of there are no bad ideas, which I know sounds funny because the name of the company is bad idea. But you're always in a position where you can pitch them whatever you want and they're never going to to tell you it's awful they'll they'll tell you no but they want you to think outside the box they want you to pitch them crazy stuff like tankers or hank howard pizza detective or whatever they want those kinds of things and so um it's fun to work there because it's a pretty long answer but it's like a different set of creative muscles right like if i work for dc um and i work on green lantern or hawkman or whatever have you there are a lot of constraints put on the story right you're operating within the mythology of the history of these characters you know that it has to come out monthly and you have a certain page format. There may be line-wide events or, you know, Green Lantern group-specific events that you have to work within and things like that. And a lot of people look at those constraints as a negative thing. I don't. Constraints breed creativity, right? Like, if I, if you don't get put inside a box, then you'll never think of a way to get outside the box. Like, the creative thing won't happen, right? So that's one set of muscles. Another set of muscles is just complete freedom to do whatever you want which happens when you do your own story and you create your own thing, you know, and I like to do both. Um, I, I love the constraints of saying, we want you to do a Superman story, but it has to be set in the specific version of Superman from the Reeve daughter films. And now I have to make that version of Superman, right? That's a great constraint that leads to all this creativity and makes me sit down and say, what would I do with a story? Well, maybe I would make it so that, Brainiac took Superman's parents before Krypton exploded and put them in a bottle, which is something I could never do if I was just doing a regular Superman story, because we all know Superman's parents are dead, right? And so um, I love doing both kinds of work. I think it it um, flexes both kind of muscles, and uh, and then eventually 
you know, having both of those sets of muscles, I think, make you a better writer overall, you know. You mentioned um, Brockton McKinney, and I yeah. uh, I live in North Carolina. I'm here in North Carolina. So oh no I, way! I've uh, I've seen I've seen Brockton at a at a mini show. I'll just say. <laughs> um, so um, where are you at in North Carolina? Uh, I live in Burlington. I live in. Oh, Burlington. Okay, I don't know where Burlington is. Yeah, um, I usually do NC Comic Con every year. Uh, but maybe did you see him in Fayetteville or? I've seen I've seen him at NC Comic Con and at. Uh, okay. Heroes Con and, and and all kinds of things, but oh, I nice. think I first met him when he was doing M Theory with um oh sure yeah. struts and then um uh, Ginger the Ginger Dead Man uh, book that he came up with he he yeah. has a lot of he has a lot of off the wall ideas also he is so. one of the most creative people I have ever met like uh, yeah. I worked with him on a project we wrote a project together called um, Savage Squad Six at Dark Horse uh, oh. the trade paperback I think comes out in September, I believe. Nice. Uh, it was a mini series. And uh, I'm sort of a very, uh, I don't know what the word would be, like disciplined, maybe methodical mm -hmm. writer. And like, if you think of all the things that you need to have a writer, you know, a story like a plot and a mm -hmm. character arc, and, you know, it has to hold up to its own internal logic and all these kinds of things. And you think of those as like the one through 10 of making a story. Like, I'm really good at the one through 10. Brock is like all 11, like he is 11, like all the time. And so his ideas are so big and like, he can just ratchet stuff up in a way that um, my brain doesn't normally work. And over the years that I've been friends with him, talking story with him and working on projects with him, he, I've definitely sort of learned how to do that a bit more by, by seeing how he does it and almost asking myself like, what would Brock do here? You know what I mean? And right. uh, he's great. And like I say, one of the most creative, creative people I know. Yeah. Yeah. Shout out to Brock McKinney. I think they just put out a, a short film last year too. It was, it was pretty. Yeah, they pretty, did. Rep Child. Yeah. Rep Child. Yep. That's right. Rep yeah. Child. Yeah. Yeah. He, uh, he wrote it, he directed it and yeah. he did all the music for it and he edited it. He did all that stuff. Yeah. I didn't know super, he did. Super talented. Too. Yeah. That's awesome. That's awesome. Okay, well, I got one more question before we go to uh, get to the quick takes. I see you got uh, some traditional art back there in the back. Sure. Yeah. I collect traditional art. It's one of my yeah. favorite parts of creating comics. Yeah. Um, I know Kyron is a traditional artist. You know, he's working on a project um, with me with a lot of horses right now. Yeah. Um, you might not know the answer to this, but sure. Uh, <laughs> but uh, there's been a lot of um, push for AI art mm -hmm. and things like that in in the in comic spaces from tech companies and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, do you know if Bad Idea um, has a stance on AI art either way or? Yeah, I don't know. Uh, I, to my knowledge, they haven't used anybody that generates AI art, mm -hmm. but that would be a question for them. Yeah. You know, whoever the execs are, I guess, you know what I'm saying? Um, I've, I've worked for the writer in the capacity. I mean, worked for the company in the capacity as a writer, but I'm not yeah. like a staff person at the company. You know, I know that I've never worked on a project that had any AI generated stuff. Um, yeah. I love traditional art, like you say. That doesn't mean that I don't also like people who do their work digitally. You know, Mitch Garrett's being a great example of that. Um, you know, I think for, for, um, for some artists, their process is their process. You know, Mitch is certainly not doing anything AI generated. He's drawing it all by hand. He just doesn't generate a piece of paper with pencils and ink on it. You know? Right. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I, I love traditional art. That's just some of the stuff I got. I got more hanging on that wall. Mm -hmm. I got so many pieces in there that I'm waiting to get framed. Um, so I love that stuff. Uh, yeah. Yeah, me too. And, and bad idea is for tankers like the. Um, uh, what was the one that 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 they were talking that Dinesh came on came on to talk about? Um, I can't remember oh, the name. Uh, the, the giant, uh, uh, probably Megalith. Yeah, Me Megalith. Megalith. Yeah. Megalith. Yeah. So Megalith is Louis Larosa. I don't know if you're, anybody's familiar with his art, but one of the absolute best artists in comics. Just, just phenomenal. Amazing. Also, just the nicest dude in the world. Like, uh, could absolutely have an ego if he wanted, but he does not. You know, super down to earth. And uh, he's been working on Megalith for a while. And, uh, yeah, that's going to be something else when that book comes out. It's getting close. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. The art on the art on all, all these projects has been just just amazing. So um, that's another thing that I think um, separates, you know, comic books from other other media like the, 
the art is just will just grab you. You know, if you're if you're in a comic book shop or you're in Barnes and Noble or whatever, you know, sometimes just the art will just grab you and just make you have to make you pick it up, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Bad Idea does a great job. I mean, their their books are some of the best looking books on the shelves, not just in terms of the interior art, which, you know, they always have great artists working with them, but also in terms of production values, you know. Uh, the books always have real nice covers on them, thick stock, you know, matte finish, gloss, you know, spot varnish, all these things. And so, um, yeah, they're, they're really attractive packages. They put a lot of thought into that. Love it. Love it. Okay. Kyron, you ready for quick takes or you got, or you got some more? I'm, I'm ready. I'm ready. Let's do it. <laughs> I didn't know I was going head to head here. What are we doing? I don't even know. I feel like I'm being thrown into the deep end, man. This doesn't feel like a very comp a very fair competition already. It's just I got a clock and that's all I know. Am I running a race? What are we doing? I don't even know. You know? We're gonna see who can do a hundred push ups. No, I'll just say it. <laughs> I'm out. <laughs> I'm out. So uh quick takes is a rapid QA session where we uh, grill our guests on their deepest, darkest secrets from the internet. No, I'm just playing. Right. We're just gonna we're just All gonna right. ask some questions to let our audience get to know you a little better. Sure, yep. Yeah. So we're gonna do five questions and you have 45 seconds each to answer them. Okay? Oh, okay, no problem. Yes, yeah. go for it. Oh, so, uh question number one. Um, I saw an Instagram post about um some drink tickets and an after oh, party. Sure. sure, yeah. Can you give us more context on how that was a missed opportunity? <laughs> yeah, so bad idea. Every year at San Diego Comic Con, they do a tiki party. It's at the Bally High uh, restaurant. It's right on the water. Gorgeous venue. This was my first year being able to go. I think that this is the third year of the party. And this year, the theme was Planet Death. And so I got drink tickets when I got there to use because all the drinks are uh, specially made to be themed to the party. So they all had Planet Death type names and things. And uh, I did not get through all the drinks because I was talking too much. And I left with some tickets. And so that's why the tickets were on there. But great venue. I have to, there had to be two, 300 people there. Uh, it was a great night. Uh, super happy. Derek was there. Uh, they had big backdrops and things that we took photos in front of. And so uh, it was a great time. Oh, that's great. Definitely. Mm -hmm. uh, definitely a missed opportunity. We got, we did get invited to the, to the party. You but missed we missed it. They'll do one next year. They'll do one next year. <laughs> we could, yeah, I, 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 San Diego's not that far. We want to drive down. I mean. <laughs> Was that four was that four hours for you or something like that? It's seven and a half if I wow. speed eight if I wow go. <laughs> California is too big. It's just too yeah, big. Yeah, it is too big. It's crazy. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh question number two. Um there's been a there's been Superman has been around for so long that mm -hmm. now we've got evil Superman, you know, Superman from uh, if he was born under the sea, there's so many different types of, of Superman stories out there. Hmm. Um, but in your opinion, in 45 seconds, can you give us the core of what a Superman story is? Superman is a person who always does the right things. It's the right thing to do. And I think a lot of people think that sounds corny for whatever reason. To me, I think that's sad. You know, um, Superman is a guy who fell out of the sky in a rocket ship in the first two human beings he interacted with took him in and loved him as their own. So how could he not have a view of humanity as being inherently good, you know? And so as far as evil Superman goes and, you know, Superman take over the world to protect us from ourselves and like all these other sort of dark versions of the characters, they just don't compute for me. Um, he's an incorruptible character. And the way you write the conflict for him is to put him in situations that challenge his values more so than some big punch fest, you know. I love it. I love it. I almost shed a tear. I almost shed a tear on that. <laughs> I, we, we're. I was. I came into to comics uh, when Superman was starting to get all these different kind of you know things, mm -hmm. or whatever. But um, Superman is is always going to be a great character to me. So and uh, you know, um, love your work on Superman. So. My all time favorite character, even when I was a kid, before I read comics, you know, from those. Reeve Donner film, Superman was always my favorite fictional character. Um, not a Batman person at all, you know. <laughs> I don't mind if somebody likes Batman, but Batman just bores me to death, you know. I don't find him interesting at all. Uh, always been a Superman person. 
I'm calling a flag on this, on Danny. Because literally our first episode was about how much you hated Superman. So I'm calling a flag on that remark about you liking Superman. That was literally the whole first episode. We've talked, we've talked so much. Superman has grown on me from you you don't remember the discussion we had about Man of Steel and me not understanding it and I hated it. And then we talked to Michael Watson and he was giving me the characteristics of Superman. I was like, you know what? He's right. That that scene made a lot more sense in the context of him being a child and not knowing that he not not wanting to reveal himself and his dad protecting him and then him going on to we had this conversation many many times Kyron stop it yeah but now you're talking about he's one of your favorites and I'm like that's the yes right now I love superman now all right I love okay. superman now okay. question 3 question yeah. number 3 okay uh, this is a this is a uh this is a question that we ask a lot of creators um just because you know, there are different perspectives on it. I know mm-hmm. me, I know my views, and I know Kyron's views, but I want to know other people, what other people think. So um, when you go to comic book conventions, there are, there are these big extravagant shows like uh, New York Comic Con, San Diego, Com- San Diego Comic Con, and then there are your small local shows. I wonder, um, which one do you prefer, big, co- big cons or small shows? So in my career, I have done well over 100 shows like i don't need maybe more than 200 i don't even know like i've done a lot i've done san diego alone 17 times right <laughs> so the big shows are great for uh getting together with a lot of colleagues you haven't seen in a while meeting your editors and stuff that you haven't seen in a while because we all work out of our houses and i live in georgia so i can't go by the editorial offices in new york and la or whatever but if I have a preference to do one, it would be to do a regional show because I love going to a city I've never been to before, eating local food, seeing what the local place is like. You know, um, I really enjoy those kinds of things. And I, I try to do, I would say in a year, I do mostly regional shows. I'll do one or two of the big ones and the rest of them will be smaller regional ones. You know, I love it. I'm, I'm along. I haven't been to either one of those huge big shows, but, you know, I think I think I would like to try them once, but I'm more of a. More of a small show guy myself. Yeah, San Diego's <laughs> great. San Diego's great for um, it's it's really great to go at once for sure and just see yeah. the spectacle of it. It takes over the whole city. You know what I mean? Let's let's um, go next year. Fourth Wall yeah, Productions in Bates, San Diego. Let's you do can it. Go to the Bad Idea Tiki Party. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. I'll go. I'll go just for that. I'll go just for that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. So uh, question number four. So um, we we talk a lot about marketing. Um, mm-hmm. when we when we talk to indie creators, there's mm-hmm. the, it's so hard. You know, you're facing against the algorithms, and you know, um, if you're starting up, it's 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 harder to get attention for a project if it doesn't have a name yet. Um, but Bad Idea has has done an amazing job with marketing. So, um, in 45 seconds, what would your advice be for for indies um, in marketing? Think outside the box. You know, I'm not, uh, I wouldn't say I'm any great marketing genius. I've never self-published anything. You kind of had to build it from scratch like that. I've always worked with a publisher. But, you know, you mentioned Bad Idea specifically. And as I was saying earlier, they're very outside the box in the terms of how they handle their approach. And um, I love it. I love to be a part of the marketing like that and to have the freedom to kind of, you know, poke some fun at myself. And, you know, uh, I don't know, just, just, be like a regular person, which is kind of who I am. You know, I, I don't, I don't think I'm some great literary light or something like that. You know what I mean? And so, um, uh, just to be human about it and and to uh, have some fun with it and think outside the box, I think is a good place to differentiate yourself from everybody trying to say that this is the book that's going to change the world and whatever. You know what I mean? Yeah. Absolutely, I love it. All right, um, last question. So for for question five, we always have our guests do a top five list off the top of their head. Mm -hmm. Um, And I was scrolling through your Instagram and I noticed that you post a lot of nature. I noticed Mm -hmm. that you uh, saw the the bird box that you that you have and and, and stuff like that. So I wonder, um, in your opinion, I want to get your top five um, nature escapes, the the top five places to go in nature to just get away from it all. Um, My favorite is the, the mountains up in Georgia. Uh, the woods up in the, up in uh, Georgia. That would probably be my favorite. Um, I went to Yellowstone Park a month ago for the first time. That was amazing. It's like seven different places all in one. There's so many different landscapes and, and topographies and things there and, and all within driving distance of each other. You know, 10 minutes away, it's completely different than where you were just standing. Uh, so that was great. 
Um, I love the, uh, I grew up in Florida originally, so I love the west coast of Florida, the beaches there. Even though I grew up on the east coast, the west coast beaches are better. Um, I don't know. What's, I don't know that I've been to other places. I don't think I've ever been to a desert. <laughs> so those would be my top three, I guess, you know? Yeah. Hey, that'll work. That'll work. No, we appreciate you doing that for us. Um, no problem. Uh, this week, Quick Takes has been brought to you by uh, Gemini Comic Supply. Go to GeminiComicSupply.com and use the promo code ACEBLADE. You get 10% off your whole order. Uh, I thought Thank we were you. going to continue on with something. And... No. <laughs> All right. I, I, I will say I, I did find the video of you on the tank and backhoe. We got, I would was it share everything it. that I made it sound out to be? Did I exaggerate at all? No, no, you did not exaggerate in any way. <laughs> Honestly, it reminds me a little bit of um, Mythbusters. It has that look of a Mythbusters okay. episode. Yeah. I could see that. I could see that. Yeah. Uh, I, I would share it, but it's off of somebody else's podcast, so I don't want any licensing issues going on there. That's where I uh, found it. Okay. But yeah. yeah, go. The way I found it, if anybody wants to, is I actually had to type in instructional film, bad idea. Uh, Venditti, and that's how it popped up for me. So go okay. check it out if you wanted to see Robert on a tank and on a backhoe and all these other things. Um, but we do want to thank you also for being a part of our show today. This has been a great time. We had fun. Hopefully you had fun too. Absolutely. Yeah, no problem at all. I'm happy to come on some other time. Oh, hey, you I guys heard on, it? I will come on again in 128 episodes from now. Dang. <laughs> I'm going to book him right now, episode 256. <laughs> we have Robert back on. No, if you have 257, <laughs> just to mess with him. If you, I mean, if you ever want to come back on, feel free to reach out to us. You're glad. We're, we will be glad to have you on. Uh, but we do want to make sure our audience follows you and keeps up with your work. Mm -hmm. um, what would be the best way to do that? Uh, yeah, I'm on Instagram, uh, X, and also Threads. It's just my name, at Robert Vendetti. Uh, so you can find me there. Nice. All right. All right. Well, Danny, since the end of the show, where can people follow you and check out your work? I'm sorry. I was searching YouTube. Uh, if you want to find me, the best place to go is fourthwallpros.com. Um, um, and if you want to find me on social media, it's at the Ace Blade on all social media platforms. Kyron, where can people find you? Um, hold on, I'm sending you the link right now that you can watch it later on. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Uh, you can find me at TaurusComics.com. You can purchase all my books there. Uh, you can also find me at all major social media platforms at Taurus Comics. And if this is your first time checking out our podcast, the Four Tales Podcast, you can go to our website. Uh, that is the number four, T-A-L-E-S podcast.com. Uh, again, that is the number four, T-A-L-E-S podcast.com. You can Go back and listen to our previous episodes, especially episode number one, where Danny profusely says he hates Spider-Man. And there's a whole episode about that. Or Superman, I'm sorry. Superman. Um, and, you know, you can check out our other episodes, buy some merchandise, help support us. What? Yeah, I think. <laughs> We're going to talk offline about that. We're going to talk <laughs> offline about that. All right. Uh, but please come back next week. This is uh, going to be something different. We don't have a guest next week. We're going to do an end of the month recap between Danny and I going over what we experienced through the month comic book wise. Uh, we might be talking about some of your guys' Kickstarters that you've been sending us by social media and uh, just have some fun. Just a general conversation. But join us back here next week, Friday, the 30th of August, 5 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific, 8 p.m. Eastern. But until then, everybody, sayonara, goodbye, and please take care of yourselves. Thanks, guys. I appreciate it. I want to know what it is Quick is trying to say.